Hi guys, welcome to this first session of CFL Level 1. Today we'll be starting with ethics and uh, for next couple of sessions we'll be taking reading 1, 2 and 3 together because a lot of their content has similarities and more or less the content mixes between uh, reading 1, 2 and 3. So let's start right away with some basic content we have in level 1 and the first reading is a very basic read it is simply talking about what ethics is why do we need them what is the difference between ethical and legal frameworks and just that so let's quickly get over reading one so let's get right into the discussion of reading one so reading one is just putting forth some questions for us to think about very basic reading so the first thing it addresses is what exactly is ethics now, if we look at any sort of dictionary or something, we'll get a very formal definition of it. But in very simple terms, ethics is just a set of beliefs. What a lot of people believe is morally correct, we call that ethics. Now, what are the challenges for ethics? Well, in the basic sense, any sort of situation in the real world that could create some sort of an unethical environment or that could tempt a person to do some unethical acts all those situations are called challenges we can have a lot of those in the real world one of the biggest challenges is the motivation to earn more money or it could even be a case where there is some sort of peer pressure or some pressure to do some unethical acts by your seniors at the job so all of those situations that could lead a person or could lead a professional to do a non-ethical activity all of those inherently become challenges then we have a small discussion as to what's the difference between something being ethical and something being legal well in the very simple terms ethical is something that we all believe is a good act and legal is something that follows the laws and rules regulations set forth by the government or any governing body for that matter now there can be acts which are ethical but are illegal and there can also be acts which are legal but are not ethical in most of the cases both of these would be same because a lot of the government laws rules regulations over the time they have evolved to make sure that ethics become part of the rule so in a lot of cases you might get situations where something if it is unethical it would also be illegal but for our exam the focus is just to be able to judge whether a particular situation or a particular act being committed by the member or the candidate of CFA Institute is that ethical or not. That's the only thing Institute is concerned with. Institute is not requiring you to be aware of all the legal laws at this stage at level one so that you can decide whether a person is supposed to be given a legal punishment or not. For your syllabus, for your exam, the focus is whether or not a person has committed anything unethical or not. Lastly, the first reading is addressing a very basic question. Why exactly do we need ethics? Like what's the use of ethics in an investment profession? Well, there are two reasons for that. Firstly, investment profession deals with money. Money that people have earned with their hard work. And when we as professionals have to manage that money or recommend some things to the client as to how they should be using that money all of that needs a lot of trust in the profession so ethics make sure that there is a lot of trust within the community both within the members candidates professionals and the people that they serve and the second reason why we need ethics is that almost all the professions in the world be it a doctor lawyer chartered accountant all of those need to have some sort of an ethical standard so that all the people are following some moral code of conduct as well as to how these professional activities are being conducted in the real world now with all that done that completes our basic discussion for reading one reading one doesn't have too much of a content it is a very basic reading just getting you introduced with what the content of ethics is. In fact, reading two also has just two major sets of content. The bulk of ethics content is all part of reading three. So let's just move to reading two quickly. 
So let's start with the content we have in reading two. Now reading two is again a very small reading about ethics, but it has two major pieces of content. Now, when you go over your books, curriculum books, a lot of the content for reading three and two is similar. So all of that similar content we'll be covering as part of reading three itself. So reading two has two major topics left. Let's start with the first one. So the first major piece of content you have in reading two is about the professional conduct program. Basically, this is the overarching mechanism by which the institute is making sure that all of its codes and standards, they are enforced properly in the real world. So this would cover the entire process of investigation, where or how the institute could receive complaints, what all investigation would they do to judge whether a person has committed something unethical or not, what all punishments can be given and if the member or candidate is not happy or not satisfied, doesn't agree with the decision of the professional conduct staff, then does he have any redressal mechanism or not? So we'll cover this entire concept using a flowchart so that you people are aware of the sequence of events. So let's start. The first event that happens is the inquiry. Basically, the professional conduct staff would somehow get to know as to whether some member or candidate has done something unethical. So this is simply talking about what are the ways in which that staff could come to know of someone doing something unethical. So there are different ways in which this can happen. Let's just quickly go over them. Firstly, you have self-disclosure. Very basic one where let's say the member has committed some unethical act, member or candidate. So wherever I say member, it includes candidate as well. Just to clarify throughout ethics, that is going to be true. So one of the cases, let's say a member has done something unethical. He feels very guilty about it. So he simply comes forward and discloses the same to the institute as well. Now, aside from this, it could be complaints. These will have to be written complaints. These can be filed by any third party out there, whether or not he or she is a member of institute or not. So any person out there can file a written complaint against any ECFA institute member or candidate reporting some sort of unethical behavior. Now the next source of getting information about a possible misconduct on part of a member or a candidate is via public sources. So media reports, or any sort of news articles. So we'll classify it as public sources. Let's say there is some sort of a fraud that has happened with any particular company and that company had an investment uh, manager. Now, if the company's fraud pertains to investments that the company has made, that investment manager would obviously be concerned or rather be a part of some sort of legal proceeding. That entire information, once it circulates in the public domain, the CFA Institute can also use that piece of information to start their own investigation into the acts of their members or candidates. And they can make their own decision as to whether the acts were ethical or not. All the legal authorities would be making a decision whether their act was legal or not. So again, the difference between ethics and legal is becoming more clear. Aside from this, you have your exam proctor. Exam proctor or the exam invigilator. So whoever is out there who is looking over to make sure that you don't do any sort of cheating or uh, prohibited acts in the exam hall while giving your exam, all of those persons have to provide a report to the CFA Institute of all the events that they believe happened in the exam hall, which may or may not be unethical. So all the suspicious events are reported. So exam proctor's report is one another source by which Institute would come to know of any sort of unethical behavior. Lastly, we have social media 
and exam monitoring or rather monitoring of exam material so social media would simply be looking at the social media interactions of members candidates and at times you can judge if those social media interactions are ethical or not let's say someone is trying to endorse a company to the public which has its production happening in some country in africa where there is a case of child slavery or child labor if a manager is openly recommending that to the investment public in general that could be thought of as some sort of morally incorrect behavior so all of those details can also be found via social media and as far as uh, candidates concerned we could also have the same thing by analyzing the exam material so exam material analysis would be when the let's say institute decides to analyze all the answers you've given and maybe the proctor didn't find out that you were doing something unethical but the exam material is revealing some of that so either of those cases would be something or some piece of information on the basis of which the professional conduct staff will be able to begin their inquiry next process is the investigation so i would like you to make a box here and the next process is the second one which is investigation this would happen once you know one of these pieces of information have been received by an institute that somehow so, um, this will happen once the institute has received some sort of information that gives some indication that a person may or may not have committed something unethical now the institute's responsibility is or rather their role is to investigate further into the matter gather more evidence so they can give a conclusive decision as to whether or not the act committed by the uh, member or the candidate was it unethical or not so investigation would involve collecting more information so there are three parties or rather three ways in which they would be collecting information so firstly it's the member or the candidate itself so interview member or candidate basically interviewing the person against whom the complaint was filed or maybe his peers or colleagues who are also members and candidates of the institute to collect some information directly from them as to what all acts happened and that extra information would give the institute a little more edge when they make a decision whether the acts were unethical or not aside from this they can interview complainants and third party so if you want more information as a professional conduct staff you can get more information directly from the person who filed the complaint in case of this so if let's say someone decides to file a complaint against the institute member the institute would try to look at that guy and look at the complainant and say do you have any more evidence that we could use to make the decision or any other third party maybe the company for which the member or candidate is working maybe any person else who is somehow connected with the entire issue being investigated and the last part here is collecting additional data and records so they'll simply want to collect data and records simply gathering any more information that the professional conduct staff may deem to be relevant for the investigation process so that is the investigation part this also i would suggest make a box now once the investigation has been done all the information that institute believes was necessary has been collected the last part of the process 
as far as professional conduct staff is concerned or rather the next part of the process would be giving a decision giving a judgment whether the acts that were reported here in form of a complaint and for which all the additional data was recorded and it was collected whether those acts are unethical or are they ethical so for that we have third stage which is decision now based on the complaint and the information collected we have three basic decisions that can be taken firstly we have no sanctions in very simple terms this means that all the evidence and information collected that does not indicate that the acts being committed were unethical so this simply says that there is no further action required against the member or candidate because the entire investigation probably did not provide enough evidence for there to be a case that the acts were unethical so institute would take no further action and the investigation would outright be complete it would be closed now next is issuing a cautionary letter now it may happen that in the investigation process there was a lot of information collected by the professional conduct staff now some information may you know give a little bit of an indication that maybe something unethical was going on but the staff maybe did not find a conclusive evidence an evidence that would make it 100% sure that there was something unethical going on. so they have some indication but it's not conclusive if it's not conclusive they cannot penalize the member or the candidate on the basis of very mild investigation information so in such a case they might simply issue a cautionary letter cautionary letter would simply be a caution to the member or the candidate think of this as a yellow card in a football game in a football game a referee gives a yellow card that's a caution like if a player makes one more bad tackle one more foul he might be sent off he might be given a red card so yellow card is this a cautionary letter the last alternative we have i think it must be obvious like if the person is not guilty if he's just being cautioned the last alternative would be where the member or the candidate is found guilty of some unethical behavior during the entire process so that is simply discipline the member or candidate which is that the professional conduct staff would take an action that would probably put a very severe sanction on the member of or the candidate now these sanctions can be something like some sort of uh, temporary suspension of membership maybe a few years it could also range all the way up to a permanent suspension which is basically you will no longer be a member of cfa institute and you will, if you are a candidate you will no longer be eligible to participate in any cfa institutes program forever so the sanctions can range from uh, lower to very extreme levels but a sanction or discipline would indicate that the member or candidate in concern has committed something unethical so this is the third box now if you've ever studied law generally there is always a redressal mechanism now we are talking about the member or the candidate against whom this action has been taken now in law if a court judges that you have done something illegal you generally have the option of filing an appeal in a higher court to review the decision of the lower courts something similar is also available to a person against whom a disciplinary action has been taken by the institute so for the next flow chart i want you to draw a line from this 3 itself
the fourth element is redressal. Now, if a member or a candidate decides to look for a redressal, now this would happen in a case where a person, uh, a member or a candidate has received a disciplinary sanction and he doesn't agree with the judgment. So he has an option to either accept this outright or reject it and redressal would come into place when he decides to reject it. So if he decides to reject it, the entire investigation would be referred to a review committee or a review panel comprising of CFA Institute members. So very similar to a sort of a jury system where you have independent members forming a panel and a jury and they would again look at all this information that was collected and they would give another decision. Now that would be conclusive and final as far as the decision about whether or not the acts were unethical or not. And again, they can have sanctions going as far as permanent suspension of someone's membership or candidate. So that's it for the entire professional conduct program. You can mark this. So let's move on to the second major content that we have in reading two. We have code of ethics. Now, code of ethics is a very basic set of six guidelines which the institute has given the name code of ethics and our purpose of studying these is not just to be aware of the broader outline of what is ethical behavior and what might not be ethical but for the exam all of these six are very important. Now, this might only be this much in terms of content, but in the exam, it is very likely that you will get one or maybe even two questions, maybe even more simply pertaining to this topic. Now, the way you will get those questions, let's just discuss that quickly before going over the content. You have certain theory questions, theoretical questions, which are given the wording most likely. or least likely. So at times if you know you practice some questions you might have come across some instances where a question says which of the following is most likely true or which of the following is least likely true something of that sort. Now these words most likely least likely trust me guys these are given just to confuse you in the exam. The institute knows the moment you see least likely all of a sudden you'll start confusing yourself and you'll try to pick out two statements which are wrong in the question and then you'll be confused as to out of the two wrong statements which is more wrong because that is what least likely says and you'll do the same thing with most likely you'll pick out two statements to be correct and then you'll be trying to judge which is more correct that would be a wrong way to solve those questions the correct way whenever you see these wordings simply mark this as true and this as false whenever a question is asking you to pick an option which is most likely correct trust me out of all the three options only one would be true you would not get a situation where two statements are true and you are supposed to judge which is more true that is not going to happen and same for least likely if the question is asking which of the following is least likely true it means you are supposed to pick one false statement out of all the three options there would not be a case where you have two false statements and now you are supposed to decide which is worse not going to happen so this is just a small tip as to how to handle these questions now this entire content you don't have to cram every single word in all of this. There are keywords that you can remember, which is why the text that I have written, it is slightly smaller. In fact, way smaller than the text that you might have in your uh, ebooks that the Institute provides. So I would suggest do give those ebooks a read for the entire language of the code of ethics. Now, out of these six, the very good chance of types of questions to come is which of the following is least likely a code of ethics which of the following is most likely a code of ethics and you get some of these six 
and after this we will be covering certain standards seven standards to be precise and each of them has subparts so question can give you three options where two are from standards and two are and one is from code of ethics and it would ask you which of the following is most likely a code of ethics so you need to be aware of what these six are you don't have to cram every single word but you need to be aware now this smaller version of code of ethics or slightly you know toned down version of it this is what i used across all my three levels of exam because this language has all the keywords in it let's go over them one by one so let's start with the first one the first one is saying you have to act with integrity diligence respect and in an ethical manner with all global market participants first let's underline the keywords integrity diligence respect ethical manner and all global market participants this is simply saying that you as a member or candidate your work has to be done with integrity do it with hard work make sure you are true to the work you also have to do diligence don't simply accept any information that is being given to you rather you have to work hard on your analysis itself every single decision you take you should have some sort of contribution in it don't simply take a decision because someone else told you to take that decision rather the institute prefers that you be diligent you do your own bit of research and analysis in the way that doesn't mean that you outright dismiss the research and analysis done by everyone else but in a generic case the preference is for you to be diligent for you to be a little aware of the situation around next we have respect very basic lastly we have ethical manner ethical manner is simply saying all the code of ethics all the standards and any sort of moral code that the society may have in terms of how we should be interacting with clients all of those i should be complying and lastly this these four things have to be valid for all global market participants now global market participants includes everyone who has any sort of interaction with the markets it could be my colleagues it could be employees of the company for which i work it could be other investors it could be investment public in general it could be investment banking firms it could be dealers brokers intermediaries stock exchanges whatever so all of those are covered when i write the term all global market participants so you are supposed to act with uh, integrity diligence respect and in an ethical manner with all of these parties now let's move to the second one which is place the integrity of profession above client and personal interest in a very simple sense profession comes first if there is any act that is going to compromise the integrity of cfa profession then that act should become top priority in terms of making sure that however you do that act it should not tarnish the integrity of the cfa profession whatever act you do as a member or candidate you need to make sure that there is no harm being brought upon the integrity of the cfa profession now next is using reasonable care and independent professional judgment mark the words reasonable care and independent professional judgment now reasonable care generally is used also when we talk about auditing reasonable care simply implies a situation where i cannot do absolute analysis let's say i want to do valuation of a company i cannot look at 100% of the information every single time because that is going to be very time consuming and there is a cost benefit constraint you know the time that i input for my work for my analysis it might not give me as much benefit at the end because if i'm using every single piece of information out there is out there the analysis would take years so you are supposed to use reasonable care reasonable care means in your professional opinion if the analysis you are doing that is reasonable which means yes i believe that i have taken adequate number of information adequate number of steps to make sure my analysis has a justification 
how much is that adequate that is a subjective opinion that would be your professional opinion or any professional person's opinion any member or candidate's professional opinion next we have independent professional judgment in the very basic sense this is saying all the decisions you take they have to be independent you cannot less let some sort of outside bias influence your decision that you are making lastly these have to be exercised in all professional activities now there could be certain activities that we classify as personal activities those are not being covered by the standard professional activities would be any sort of investment analysis investment action or maybe recommending something or anything else that you do as a participant of the global capital markets next up we have practice in professional and ethical manner again as a member or a candidate once you become part of the industry once you become part of the uh, capital market you have to make sure that you are practicing you are doing your work in not only a professional manner but also following all the ethical guidelines laid out either by institute or by any other regulatory authority that your work might be subject to and as a small note the code also says you are also supposed to encourage other members and candidates to do the same so you are also supposed to encourage them to practice in a professional and ethical manner at number 5 we have promote the integrity and viability of global markets now link the fifth one with the second for a little better understanding the second one was talking about placing the integrity of profession above everything else profession comes first you do any act that reflects poorly on the entire profession that act would be unethical this is doing the same thing except now it is not talking about profession it's talking about the market as a whole so there is small difference let's say i commit something that makes the people think that all cfa professionals are unethical in terms of the work they do that is tarnishing the integrity of the profession but let's say i commit a fraud which now deters all the investing public in general to put their money in the capital markets this time people start to believe that markets are not safe this is not just cfa profession that is being affected now this is the entire market that is being affected the second situation is a case of fifth so i am supposed to promote the integrity and viability of capital global markets i am not supposed to engage in any act that would tarnish the integrity of the markets as a whole because markets are more or less where people are investing and they need to trust that the market is safe for them to be able to make those investments the moment that trust is taken away people are no longer interested in making any sort of investments or participating in the capital markets last code of ethics is maintain and improve the professional competence so maintain and improve professional competence and you know try to do the same for the other professionals as well try to make sure they are also improving and maintaining their professional competence so firstly what does professional competence mean well you are watching cf videos so you are gaining knowledge which is pertaining to cfa which is pertaining to finance which is pertaining to investment all of this knowledge is what we call professional competence basically all the knowledge and skill you have acquired as a profession now your goal is to make sure that you maintain your knowledge base so well to put it simply as a student you will understand it very good just because you clear level 1 in some time doesn't mean you forget what you studied at level 1 you should always keep it in mind so maintain the professional competence is simply saying your professional level of skill you should at least try to maintain it and over the course of time you should also try to improve it add more skills add more experience to it now one of the things for improving professional competence is to participate in regional society events once you become a professional in fact you can participate in them as a candidate as well now they make sure that you are up to date with what is changing in the industry because you might have given the exam let's say 10 years back the industry all of a sudden has a lot of technological advancement 
you need to keep up with that. So that is what improving the professional competence signifies. So that completes our six code of ethics. Mind you, you are not supposed to cram them word by word. Just have a mental note as to what the keywords are. Also, because the questions are very highly likely to come in this format where the question is asking you whether something is part of code of ethics or not or something is violating code of ethics or not you don't have to cram every single word you don't have to rewrite all six of these in the exam the exam is mcq based so you simply have to be able to identify out of the options as to which one seems correct so you don't have to cram all of these word by word because there is no case where you'll have to write all six of them down for the institute. So that completes our code of ethics and with that reading two is also done. Now let's move to reading three. So the next bit of content we have in the syllabus is about standards of professional conduct and this is arguably the most important topic that you will have in ethics across all three levels of CFA. In fact, this is the topic that is going to stay the same across all three levels. So you studied once at level one and you have practically studied for level two and three as well. Now the standards, you have a total of seven standards, each with certain subparts. We'll be covering all the standards and all their subparts. In total, there are seven standards. So let's start with the first standard, which is professionalism. Now, within the standard of professionalism, we have 1A, which is the first subpart, which is knowledge of law. Let's look at it in a little bit more detail. Just before we start with the discussion, a small update. All of these standards, the language that I'll be using, it has been taken directly or rather derived directly from the official document of CFA Institute, which covers both code of ethics and standards of professional conduct. I'll have that official document linked with the video itself. You can look over that document if you want and the language we'll be using at times might be slightly different. This is to make sure that you remember stuff in the exam. That language in the actual document, that is the official language of the standard. So there might be small differences here and there, but the broader meaning that I'll be explaining would be more or less the same. So let's start knowledge of law. The entire standard and all of its content has three parts. The first part is members and candidates must understand and comply with all applicable laws, rules, regulations governing their professional activities. So you should first of all understand all the laws that are applicable to your professional activities. This is not talking about you as a person. This is not talking about the fact that I should not be driving at a higher speed because that is applicable to me personally. Rather, this is talking about all the laws which pertain with your professional activity. You should understand them and you should also comply with them. The reason why this is important is because there can be a situation where a member or a candidate commits a violation of the standard and then tries to get away with it simply by stating that he was not aware of the law. That situation is not going to exist. You cannot try to plead innocence by claiming that you are not aware of the law, at least not when it concerns with violations of law as far as your professional activities are concerned. Then the next bit of content in this first part is that you have to understand and comply with all applicable laws, rules and regulations. So there can be laws, corporate acts which apply to your activities. There could also be certain rules and regulations given by Ministry of Corporate Affairs or maybe the regulating body, the SEBI or the SEC in case you are in the US or Fed might have some recommendations for people working in banking companies. All of those regulations have to be complied with. So it says all applicable laws, rules and regulations. And just to clarify, when I say law, rules and regulations, this includes all the regulations and rules set out by the CFA Institute as well. So the entire content we are covering in ethics, that if you don't follow, that is also covered in this part. So if you don't comply with any of these standards, that would be a violation of firstly this knowledge of law 
you cannot claim that I was not aware of the standards. The next complication we have in this standard is there can be situations where let's say I am based in India and I'm working here but I am dealing with a client who let's say works in US. Now I have regulations in India, I have regulations in US, I also have CFA Institute's recommended guidelines about these ethics. So I have multiple sets of rules and regulations and there can be instances where <clears throat> some of them are conflicting with each other. The institute simply clarifies that in case there is a conflict between any two sets of laws, rules, regulations, you are supposed to follow the more strict one. Now how do I decide which is more strict? Well there are two ways. Firstly, the one that has more number of conditions for you to comply with. That is obviously the more strict one. Secondly, generally I can also judge strictness on the basis of how severe the punishment is. So if a law or a standard or a regulation has a very severe punishment as compared to something else which is let's say simply imposing a small amount of fine. In that case, I am supposed to comply with the one which is more strict which will have slightly severe punishment. So you can think of strict law either in terms of punishment or you can think of it in terms of which has more conditions for you to comply with. Let's go over the last point we have in the standard. So this is saying you must not knowingly participate or assist in any violation. So there can be situations particularly you know when people are working in jobs or they're working in groups it is possible that you are working on a project as a group and you may not know there is a violation but the entire group project has some sort of violation of some law or rule or regulation. The institute is clearly saying you must not knowingly participate. So you must not be aware of the situation and still continue your participation. If you come to know about a violation later on, let's say you know project was of three months you came to know that there is a violation after one month. In that case, institute is saying you must dissociate yourself with that particular project, with that work. Generally, what you can do is you can approach your supervisors or look for the company's legal counselor to see as to what sort of redressal can be done. Is there any correction that can be done? And in an extreme case where even the supervisors are unable to help, you might even have to consider whether you should continue with the job in the first place. So you might even have to consider leaving the job in case that involves you being involved or participating in any sort of violation of any law, rule or regulation. So this is not just talking about uh, violation of code of ethics and uh, standards, but rather all applicable laws, rules, regulations about your professional activities. So if there is some activity you get involved in unknowingly, once you get to know about it, you are supposed to dissociate yourself. So that completes our standard 1A knowledge of law. Now let's quickly go over the standard 1B. Next up we have another standard within professionalism which is 1B independence and objectivity. It is simply saying use reasonable care and judgment to achieve professional independence and objectivity. Now this standard in terms of the general language is very similar to the code of ethics that we read which was saying use reasonable care and independent professional judgment. So over here you have one additional term added aside from that which is professional objectivity. Now objectivity is being able to look at both sides of the argument. So your decision shouldn't be based simply because you are let's say recommending a buy on a stock. So your decision shouldn't be influenced by the fact that you are supposed to recommend buy or maybe that you previously recommended buy and now if you change it to sell your perception in the market would change. So your decisions have to be objective as well where you are able to analyze both good and negative sets of information in equal light. Then we have a case specific to situations that could compromise my professional independence and my objectivity. Now this is the exact wording of the standard but I have broken it down into this format so that it is easier to understand. So the standard is simply saying members and candidates mind you all the standards unless I specifically mention it here are applicable to members and candidates alike. So members and candidates <coughs> must not offer, solicit or accept. Let's look at these three words. Offer is to you know give to someone else. 
solicit is some sort of a demand and accept is simply someone else has given you you take it that is accept so you are not supposed to offer solicit or accept any gift benefit compensation or consideration so now the concern is if i am not supposed to do any of this how am i supposed to earn a living genuine concern now let's look at the next part that would clarify why a lot of the payments that are being exchanged are not a violation of the standard outlay now if we just look at these two points that rules out any sort of payment that anyone is getting in an investment profession or you know wealth management profession but to make sure that not all the payments outright are classified as violation of the standard we need to study the next part of this which is you must not accept uh, sorry you must not offer solicit or accept any gift benefit compensation or consideration that could reasonably be expected to compromise your or someone else's independence and objectivity so the first part of the standard was saying that you have to be professionally independent and objective and the second part is restricting you from taking any sort of compensation consideration or offering it such that your own independence and objectivity is compromised now how do we decide if objectivity and independence has been compromised well the simple answer is you cannot now the key phrase here is reasonably be expected now the institute or the standard is not saying that we have to only red flag those gifts compensations which in reality end up affecting rather if any outsider looking in would look at that gift and compensation and get a feeling that it could reasonably expect or compromise the independence or objectivity of the member or the candidate in question in that case we will consider it to be a violation so general payments which we get let's say you know salary or anything else you get paid by your client all of those are generally for the service of client for the service of employer so those are not expected to compromise my independence and objectivity so the standard payments because they do not expect or we do not expect them to compromise my independence and objectivity we would generally not consider them as violations now there is one particular case which the institute has stressed with concern to this which is reports now as a candidate or as a member once you start working in the industry once you get a job you will be expected to create a lot of reports you know some for the client some for the employees so on and so forth how you get paid for those reports is something that could be part of a violation of the standard 1b now if let's say a company approaches me and they say that well we want you to do a valuation report on us and we'll pay you now the concern is how exactly will they pay me if they say or if rather we both agree that if the valuation is very high my payment would be high and if the valuation is low i get nothing that payment structure or that sort of fee structure is reasonably expected to compromise my independent judgment so in such a case the recommendation from institute is that all sort of reports that you are doing or any sort of analysis that you are doing for these reporting it should be on a flat fee structure which is the fee should not be tied to the outcome of the report rather the fee should be fixed and it should be predetermined before the reporting process starts itself so whether the report is good in terms of company valuation or the company valuation in the report is very bad the fees that is received for making the report should be flat should be fixed one other case with regard to reports is now if let's say i am doing valuation of a company let's say i am doing valuation of apple and apple has come to me saying that okay we want you to do a valuation let's say in my independent and professional opinion apple is given a very good valuation now i have not done any sort of compromise on my independence objectivity in this case the fees was also flat but the public might still have some sort of concern 
as to why Apple is paying for the valuation that I did of the Apple company itself. So those specific cases are known as issuer paid research or issuer paid reports. So if the company on which I'm reporting is also the company that is paying me, even if it is on a flat fee basis, I should still disclose that fact outright in my reports that this report was prepared on request of Apple and they are the ones that are paying me to further clarify to the general investment public as to what the arrangement is. So that completes our standard. Now let's move to the next standard. So guys, the next standard that we have is 1C, which is misrepresentation. Now, the language for the standard is relatively straightforward. It is simply saying a candidate or a member should not be making any sort of misrepresentation about the investment work. So it could be investment analysis, recommendation or action. And it could even involve misrepresentation in any other professional activity. So any activity done as a professional. Now, the key word in this standard is knowingly. Now, before we discuss knowingly, let's quickly look at what a misrepresentation is. Misrepresentation is nothing but a mistake. And the word knowingly has a lot of importance here because if I make a mistake, if I end up presenting some sort of information which I know is not correct, then I would be in a violation of the standard. So a simple human error, again, doesn't end up violating the standard. So if you make an error, you can always correct it. The standard is not going to be violated in that case. The violation would only occur if you made a misrepresentation knowingly. Now, aside from this, there is one particular complication with regards to this standard that the Institute is focusing on. That pertains to plagiarism. Plagiarism is basically the act of using someone else's analysis, research models, or someone else's work and not citing sources, not giving them the credit for the work. So it could be a case where I've basically used another analyst's research work and I haven't given a source or I haven't cited sources for it. I haven't given credit to that particular researcher. I'm claiming the entire research to be mine. That would be plagiarism. And that itself is a violation of standard 1C misrepresentation. So if I'm using someone else's work and not giving enough credit, not citing the relevant sources, even that would be a violation of standard 1C misrepresentation. But there are two exceptions to this. So there are two cases in which you won't be violating the standard and you won't even have to cite sources. So the first case is when you have reputed sources. For example, every 10 years census data is collected by the central government and there is only one authority, one body of organization that collects that data. So if I'm using that particular data in my analysis, I don't have to specifically quote the organization or the source from which I got the data. Mind you, in real world, we always prefer to quote all the sources, whether or not it is known, reputed or anything else. To be in the best position, you should always cite all the sources so that the consumer of the information that you are providing, the client, he has a better idea as to what your base of information is. Now, if you're using information from a reputed or known source, in that case, even if you don't cite the sources, you won't be in the violation of the standard 1C. The second exception is... <coughs> Now, the second exception pertains to models, research work, analysis, or general information that is the property of the company or the firm that you work with. And there could be a lot of people who have contributed to those research models to that piece of analysis. You are allowed to omit the names of employees who have left the firm who might have worked on those company models. So simply omitting the name of people who have left the firm, who are no longer employees of the firm, 
is acceptable. That will not be a violation of the standard. But claiming that the research that you are using is yours and yours alone, that would be a violation. So the standard is drawing a line where simply omitting the name of past employees is permissible. But claiming that you are responsible for the entire analysis done, you are responsible for the research models, that is a violation. So there is a fine line there and you need to be able to identify whether a situation is crossing that line or whether it is staying within the limits. So let me repeat it again. Omitting the name of employees who have left the firm, who were responsible for making some research model or analysis, that is fine. It's acceptable. But claiming that research or analysis to be yours and yours alone, that would be a violation. So that is it for the standard 1C misrepresentation. Let's move on to the next standard. The last standard that we have within standard 1 is 1D, which is misconduct. Now misconduct, the entire content of the standard is what you have. You don't have any further you know, additional complications or additional cases to discuss. But misconduct standard, the way it is written, you can divide the standard into two parts. So let's look at both parts. First is not engage in any professional conduct involving fraud, dishonesty or deceit. So this is simply saying in a professional capacity, that is when you are doing work as a CFA professional, be it a member or a candidate, again, both are applicable. When you're working in that capacity, in a professional capacity, you are not supposed to be involved in any sort of fraud, dishonesty or deceit. So don't try to deceit the clients, deceit the employer or any other participant of the market. Do not do any act which is dishonest or commit any fraud in the professional capacity. The second part of the standard is saying do not commit any act. So this would be not commit. So this not will carry on here as well. So it is not commit any act that reflects adversely on professional reputation competence and integrity. Mind you, this is talking about any act. And the first one was talking about only professional conduct. Which means the second part of statement or second part of the standard is specifically talking about any act whatsoever, whether you do it in a professional capacity or in a personal capacity. If that act has the potential for people to believe that the profession is not reputed, it is not very competent, it doesn't have integrity, then also that would be considered a violation of misconduct. Let me just clarify this with an example. You know, we're talking about commit any act. So professional acts are in any case covered here. Let's say I was driving and I got a chalan for over speeding. Does that chalan have the potential for people to believe that CFA professionals are not competent in their work? No. In simple sense, no, because a lot of people get driving chillons. It's a normal thing to happen. And while that is an act of violation of some law, it is not enough for people to have any sort of impact on the professional reputation, integrity or competence. The converse case is, let's say a member or a candidate decides to rob a bank at night. So he's no longer working at his job. He's doing this in his personal capacity. But once people get to know that he has tried to done such an act, that would reflect poorly on the profession as a whole, the reputation, competence and integrity of profession. So that act would be a violation, but a simple violation like, you know, a driver chalan or something similar, any sort of very minor fine or something that has no consequence whatsoever on your profession, that is not a violation. So two parts, first is in professional capacity, don't get involved in any fraud, dishonesty or deceit. And second part is in any other capacity, do not commit any act that reflects adversely on your professional reputation, competence and integrity. So that completes our first standard professionalism and that would also complete this video session. I hope you all liked it and it was informative. Do check out the remaining classes. Again, I want to stress ethics and quants for level one is available for free for everyone to try. So do try out those classes if you feel comfortable with the teaching style. Only then should you be registering for the paid membership. So I hope this was all informative. See you in the next one. Ethics should probably be around three 
sessions in total. So in the next one, we'll be covering a lot of the remaining standards and the final one or two standards and the remaining topics about GIPS that we'll cover in the third section. Hi guys, so hopefully you did like that video, found it informative. If you have any sort of doubts about the content we covered in this class or in any other session or in general about syllabus or anything else you might need my help for, you can contact me, the details are here. And I link these same details in the video description as well. So see you in the next one. Bye.